What's up, everybody? You're in tune to the basement. This is JC on Whitefish Community Radio, whitefishcommunityradio.com. That was Intergalactic by the Beastie Boys, in case you didn't know. Right now, we got this track from Fort Minor. It's an instrumental recorded in Jay-Z's studios by Mike Shinoda of Linkin Park. Laugh all you want, Linkin Park, yeah. Dude made some seriously sick beats, though. So right now we're going to get into This Week in Hip Hop. Got a couple birthdays. July 1st, 1971, Melissa Arnett, also known to you as Missy Misdemeanor Elliot. It was her birthday on July 1st, 1971. I played a track. She freaking wit. The instrumental. I know Candace like that if she heard it wherever she's at. G-Funk, Brown Town, wherever the hell she's at. I know she dug on that. I'll play a track by her a little bit later. I'll get to that. July 2nd, 1976. Simone Risco, also known as Moni Love. Most people might not know who she is. Uh, She was a DJ, kind of foreheaded the woman's movement. And uh, in hip-hop, she was out there with Roxanne Shante, that sort of thing. So, happy birthday to her. July 2nd, 1969, Joseph Anthony, also known as Tony Touch, the Peacemaker. He's got several compilation albums out with a lot of renowned hip-hop artists on it. He's New York-based, Latin, kind of hangs out with the Beat Nuts, that kind of crew. July 3rd, 1971, Donnie Shaquan Lewis, also known as Skills. He ain't mad no more. He used to be called Mad Skills before that. Dropped it after Sound Bombing 2, I do believe. I'll play a track by him also. It will also be star- starring Missy Elliott. Because they're both from Virginia, or have lived in Virginia anyway. I think Skills was born in Detroit, truth be known. He always claims VA, though. All right, we got some releases this week. June 28th, 1988, Public Enemy released It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. It's their second album. The goal of the album, I find this pretty interesting, is they are trying to make a hip-hop equivalent to Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. And the biggest deal with that is Marvin Gaye's What's Going On had a ton of social commentary, and that's where P.E. kind of platformed into that realm of hip-hop by trying to mimic that and deliver it to a different crowd that wasn't listening to Marvin Gaye. The original title of the track was actually Countdown to Armageddon, but they decided to decide to change it, come with, come up with something a lot harder to put on the front of a CD, much less read the whole title in your playlist nowadays. They also recorded most of it with a faster tempo, which most people are familiar with. P's faster tempo. They want to make it a better live show for the fans. So they kind of up the tempo on all the beats. And yeah, it was mostly Hank Shockley on the on the beats. And he produced the whole time they were out on tour for the first album. And basically they came back to the studio, recorded the thing in I think six weeks, and put it out, and it's one of the best albums in hip hop. Um a lot of people rank it high as one of the best albums ever but i'll be playing a little bit of that later on june 29th 1993 notorious big released the track party and bullshit most people know that track it's the debut single on it on the soundtrack for who's the man it was also the first single that notorious put out on his own got a lot of hype it sampled when the revolution comes by the last poets which were also a social socially aware group out of new york that they weren't so happy with notorious uh, quoting their track because they were using it as something to basically call out people that weren't willing to get up and be active and notorious uses it as 
basically the opposite partying and bullshitting all the time that's all he wants to do an interesting fact about this track is he performed it with Tupac in 1994 before they you know broke out in this whole east coast west coast feud that was fueled by the media blah 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 they both had to die so that it wouldn't happen as much it still happens can't say it didn't ever happen again but it's definitely opened a lot of people's eyes july 1st 1991 ghetto boys released we can't be stopped ghetto boys of course are from houston so you know i gotta mention them shout to my boy juan down there i already shout out my dad so he he hears that melba too shout out to melba anyhow this is the fourth album from the ghetto boys it went platinum It only took a few weeks to record, which is highly believable because really their their lyrics are pretty simple. The lead track, Mind Playing Tricks on Me, is one of the most known tracks by the Ghetto Boys, if not the most known track. And it pretty much, it, it was released before the album and it put them on the map, essentially. It took them four albums to get on the map, but... You know, the cover of the album features Miss it's like Bill it's Bushwick Bill on the front, and he had recently been this is great. He had recently been shot in the eye by his wife or girlfriend, doesn't matter, by his significant other. He was shot in the eye. He was in the hospital. And if you don't know who Bushwick Bill is, he's a midget. So he's a, a excuse me, a small person. He's a small person, so he was shot in the eye. Scarface and their record producer went to the hospital to visit him and snuck him out in the hall on the stretcher, took the patch off of his eye, and they put like a fifth ward boy's hat on his head and took this picture. It's so it lives up to the name Ghetto Boys, of course. It was uh This album was denied by Geffen Records, which we talked about them and their problem with the roots last week but Geffen turned him down because it was too violent the lyrics were too violent if only they knew now what they did then July 2nd 1996 Nas nasty Nas in your area released it was written it's a second album the follow up to Illmatic one of the top 10 hip hop albums of all time easily I don't care who you are it was, however, his best-selling release. Um, it was written was his best-selling release. It featured Street Dreams, Affirmative Action, which was along with his uh, his group, The Firm, who were they kind of rapped about mafioso stuff, being really like Italian gangster kind of stuff. And another, the biggest track off that album was If I Ruled the World, starring Mrs. Lauren Hill. I played that one for you earlier. July 2nd, 1991, Slick Rick released The Ruler's Back. It's a second album. It was quickly recorded in probably a month or so due to the fact that Slick Rick had been sentenced to a five-year jail sentence. So they chop, chop, let's get in the studio and make this album. I think that's why it didn't come out as, as good as his first album. He still lives on as one of the greatest storytellers as far as MCs go. Definitely out of the old school lot of folks, he's definitely one of the best. So that's about it for releases. Thanks for keeping it tuned into the basement. My name's JC. Got some more tracks for you before my boys come in here and they're they're gonna play a little metal for y'all after my my set's done. And their show's called The Void. Hopefully it's not void of good music. Ah, yeah, the jokes are going to be so easy. Anyhow, we'll keep cranking here. Thanks for tuning in to the basement. If you got any friends that aren't aware, please let them know. You can download the app. It's really simple. Get it on any device that you want. You can listen to it anywhere in the world except for Happy Valley. We all know that as a fact. 
So here we go. Whitefish Community Radio. Whitefishcommunityradio.com.